Hello and welcome back to the future. This is your boy Kamal once again and today we have this really cool integral suggested to me by my good friend Danny from the Netherlands. So thank you Danny for the integral and thank you the Netherlands for Virgil van Dijk. So what we have here is the integral from 0 to 1 of the inverse cotangent of root x squared minus 1 divided by root x squared minus 1. And I've read that wrong both times. It is root x squared minus 2 and root x squared minus 2. Terribly sorry about that. Anyway, so how do we approach this integral? Let's start off by writing the inverse cotangent in terms of an inverse tangent. And we can do that by reciprocating the argument. So we can write this as the integral from 0 to 1 of the inverse tangent of 1 by root x squared minus 2 times 1 by root x squared minus 2 dx. And now that we have this inverse tangent term, let's translate our integration problem into a double integral by writing this as the integral from 0 to 1 of the inverse tangent of y divided by root x squared minus 2, where it makes sense for the limits to be 0 and 1, because as y would approach 0, we'd get inverse tangent 0, which is 0, and as y approaches 1, we get the term we have in the above integrand, times 1 by root x squared minus 2 dx. So we know what the integral what with respect to y should look like. It should look like integral 0 to 1. Okay, this is an inverse tangent. That means we need in the denominator 1 plus the square of the argument. So that's 1 plus y squared divided by x squared minus 2. Terribly sorry about that. And in the numerator, we need a 1 by root x squared minus 2 term with the differential element. Okay, cool. And we also have this 1 by root x squared minus 2 term tagging along. Now, let's expand using x squared minus 2. So we multiply the numerator and denominator by this term. That gives us the double integral from 0 to 1 of root x squared minus 2 divided by x squared minus 2 plus y squared times 1 by root x squared minus 2. Integration first with respect to y and then with respect to x. Okay, cool. So we have some nice cancellation taking place, which implies that our integral is now the double integral from 0 to 1 of 1 by x squared plus y squared minus 2 dy dx. Now there are a couple things to notice about our new double integral. First, we're integrating with respect to y first, and the second thing is that the integrand is a function of x squared plus y squared. Now let's take a moment to analyze this. Here's the y-axis and here's the x-axis. And if I draw the quarter circle x squared plus y squared equal to a squared in the first quadrant, then notice that this is symmetric about the line y equal to x. So instead of integrating from 0 to 1 with respect to y, I could just integrate from 0 to the line y equal to x and double the result. So this means i equals the integral from 0 to 1, integral 0 to x times 2 of what exactly? We have 1 by x squared plus y squared minus 2 dy dx, which is pretty cool, but I'd like to now translate back into a double integral from 0 to 1 kind of thing. So how exactly do I plan to do that? Well, I'll make the substitution of y equal to t times x, which implies that dy equals x times dt. And for y to approach 0, we need t to approach 0, whereas for y to approach x, we need t to approach 1. So i here equals 2 times the double integral from 0 to 1 again of x divided by x squared plus x squared t squared minus 2 dt dx. And we can factor out an x squared term from the denominator and write this as x divided by x squared times 1 plus t squared minus 2 
dt dx. Now, what we have here as the integrand is a continuous function of both x and t. So using Fubini's theorem, we can switch up the order of the integration operators and write this as the double integral from 0 to 1 of 2x divided by x squared times 1 plus t squared minus 2 dx dt. And the reason I pop that 2 back into the integrand is because, well, I now have a nice structure for the antiderivative with respect to x. This is a logarithmic structure. So we have the integral from 0 to 1 of the logarithm of 1 plus t squared times x squared minus 2 divided by 1 plus t squared with the limits being 0 and 1 dt. Now as x approaches 1, we have the logarithm of t squared plus 1 minus 2, which would of course be t squared minus 1. So we have t squared minus 1 here, divided by 1 plus t squared. And as x approaches 0, we have the logarithm of minus 2 divided by 1 plus t squared dt. Okay, cool. Now obviously we have complex numbers involved, but we can get rid of them, and you can see that this is all just a real number. If I perform some tricks here with the t squared minus 1 term, if I write this as 1 minus t squared with a negative sign, I have log minus 1 minus t squared divided by 1 plus t squared dt minus the integral from 0 to 1 of log negative 2, which is of course a constant, divided by 1 plus t squared dt. Now, what exactly is the logarithm of negative x? Well, that would be the logarithm of x times negative 1. So that would be log x uh, plus the logarithm of negative 1. OK, cool. And what exactly is negative 1 in the polar form? That's e to the i pi. And this implies that log negative x equals log x plus i times pi. OK, cool. So that means we would have an i times pi term over here minus an i times pi term over here. So we're getting rid of the imaginary numbers involved. And this implies that i equals the integral from 0 to 1 of the logarithm of 1 minus t squared divided by 1 plus t squared. Wait, I should expand this. OK. Uh, plus i times pi times the integral from 0 to 1 of, I forgot the differential element. Uh, Zonaid Parker is going to give me a lot of stick for that. Anyway, so we have, wait, I'm going to have to give it some space here. OK, cool dt divided by 1 plus t squared. That's for the first integral. And now for the log negative 2 thing, we have minus log 2 plus i times pi times the integral from 0 to 1 of dt divided by 1 plus t squared. So we see that this thing cancels out with this thing. And we're left with i being the integral from 0 to 1 of the logarithm of 1 minus t squared divided by 1 plus t squared dt. And we have a minus sign log 2 times this integral here, which is, of course, the inverse tangent integral, which would yield, with these limits, pi by 4. OK. So i equals negative pi by 4 times log 2 plus the integral from 0 to 1 of the logarithm of 1 minus t squared divided by 1 plus t squared dt. And this integral looks like it could use a trig sub. So that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to let t equal the tangent of theta. And this implies that dt equals secant squared theta d theta. And I never really use the theta variable ever. I'm 
this is the first time I'm using it in a video because, well, you can see I'm not very good at writing it. Anyway, so we have i being equal to negative pi by 4. I used to write theta like this. Like, you know, the very basic way of writing it, but now I'm trying to write it like this. Whatever. Negative pi by 4 log 2 plus integral. Now, for t to approach 0, we need theta to approach 0 as well. And for t to approach 1, we need theta to approach pi by 4. So we have the logarithm of 1 minus tangent square theta divided by 1 plus tangent square theta times secant square theta d theta. And 1 plus tangent square is, of course, secant square. So that means we have negative pi by 4 times log 2 plus the integral from 0 to pi by 4 of the logarithm of 1 minus tangent square theta d theta. Ah, um, much better. I guess that, yeah, this is not going as planned. Now, this is a pretty fascinating integral, and to evaluate it, I'm going to expand the tangent term. So I have integral 0 to pi by 4, 1 minus sine square theta divided by cosine square theta d theta. And that means I have the integral from 0 to pi by 4 of log cosine square theta minus sine square theta. Using the properties of the logarithm, I can write this as minus pi by 4, uh, integral, min uh, integral from 0 to pi by 4, log cosine square theta, where I've invoked the properties of the logarithm as well as the linearity of the integration operator. And cosine square minus sine square is, of course, cosine 2 theta, so I have integral log cosine 2 theta minus the integral from 0 to pi by 4. And again, using the properties of the logarithm, that exponent can be written as a coefficient. Log cosine theta d theta, and I probably should have. I should either omit it completely or just write it every time. Okay, cool. So... These are a couple of integrals that I've evaluated many, many times. The first integral here, if we perform the transformation going from the 2 theta to the theta world, then we would get 1 half the integral from 0 to pi by 2 now of the logarithm of cosine theta d theta. And of course, we have this minus 2 integral 0 to pi by 4 log cosine theta d theta. And this integral here is the first one, that is, is Euler's famous log trig integral. So we have negative one half times log two. So that's negative one quarter times pi times log two. How could I forget the factor of pi in the result? Anyway, and this integral is something that I've evaluated numerous times using a series expansion for the cosine function. This thing is supposed to evaluate to... Uh, one quarter, right? Two times Catalan's constant minus pi times log two. And that means we have negative pi by four log two, and we have minus Catalan's constant minus pi by two, no wait, plus pi by two log two, meaning that we have pi by four log two minus Catalan's constant. That was the result of this integral. And the integral, the target integral that is, has this term in it as well, negative pi by four times log two. So this implies that i equals negative pi by four times log two plus pi by four times log two minus Catalan's constant, which implies that the integral we have is just another really cool integral representation of Catalan's constant. I hope you enjoyed the video. Be sure to like and subscribe. Thank you once again for the integral. Do drop me a follow on Instagram and support the channel if you want on Patreon. Thank you. See you next time.